So Augustine's Confessions, why is it called Confessions? He, he is confessing some things, all right? Who, who's he confessing them to? The reader? Does he need your approval or does he need you to understand who he, who he is? Some people write confessions like that. He's really talking to God, um, and he's trying to make sense out of his screwed up life, which is still screwed up, even after his conversion to Christianity, and living as a Christian for, for several years. Um, so why, why is he writing this? He, he tells us at, at a certain point in, in book two that um, says, who am I narrating all of this to? Not to you, God, but to my own kind in your presence, to that small part of the human race who may chance to come upon these writings. Um, turns out to be a much larger part of the human race than, than he expected. And to what end? That, all, that I and all who read them may understand what depths there are from which we are to cry unto thee. For what is more surely heard in thy ear that, uh, than a confessing heart and a faithful life? And he's, he's using this metaphor that's coming from the Psalms of crying from the depths. And you notice over and over again in this text, he says things like, um, I'm a riddle to myself. I'm a mystery. And he's not trying to, you know, be, be uh, precious about this, you know. I'm a mystery, I'm a special snowflake or anything like that. You know, the kind of stuff that people say to try to build your self-esteem. He's saying, I don't understand what the hell's wrong with me. I, I understand some of the things that are wrong with me. And every time I probe, I go a little bit deeper. And wow, there's even more screwed up crap down there. And how can you figure this sort of thing out? Well, you know, living in part and paying attention to what you're doing. But thinking about it and writing it down is a way to try to puzzle it out, to make sense of it. This is why some people journal. Do any of you journal or write in a diary? If you do, it, you know, sometimes that's helpful because you, you actually, when you put something down in front of yourself, you're able to get a... a a picture of it for yourself that you're not when you're looking just within within yourself. Or have any of you ever been told by friends or family, here's what's screwed up about you, and, and here's what I don't understand about the way you behave. I, I imagine a few of you have had that happen. Parents. With parents, yeah. Uh, I mean, you guys are just, you, you know, a, a few years out of adolescence, so that was the time for, I, I, I would imagine, quite a few of you were you were not only a mystery to yourself, but to everybody else around you. You're still trying to figure some of this stuff out. Um, so Augustine is somebody that we can, we can relate to pretty easily. Um, why am I having you read this text? Well, you know, he does talk a lot about love. Love is going to be really central. He also talks a lot about desire, something that we haven't talked about that much. And he talks about friendship in some really important ways. And he, he compares and contrasts different friendships that have been um, central in his life. With some of the earlier authors, we saw them talking about friendship. Here's what friendship is. Here's what it's like. Here's how it works. Um, but it really wasn't until we got to Cicero that we saw somebody saying, here's a friendship that, that showed me what friendship is, and it changed my life. And look at those people over there. I'm going to name some names. Their friendships are screwed up. The people who, who followed Tiberius Gracchus and went against their own, you know, uh, homeland and, and were traitors and said, I'm doing this because I'm friends, that screwed up their life. Augustine is doing something like that raised to a much higher level. You know, for instance, in telling us about the pear tree and, and, and asking himself, what the hell was I doing? He's, he's probing into the nature of bad friendship. And then in, in looking at the friend of his who died and his, his deep grief and what it did to him and what was, what was really underlying that, again, he's probing the nature of friendship. Uh, and then later on, he has uh, some, some better friendships and he actually lives with a bunch of friends. Um, and he reflects on that. That can teach us something. And Augustine is teaching us through telling us about his own life. So I think it's a little bit easier to relate to. 
I think Augustine is also very easy for you to relate to because he is somebody who actually has um, desires like us. Um, he struggles for years and years and years with some of his desires. And, you know, some of them, he's, he's not, he doesn't have a problem with food, you know. Um, he has a problem with sexual desire. As a matter of fact, he even wants to sort of have it both ways. Um, all the way through recognizing, yeah, I, I should probably should convert and, and live a, you know, you know, phil, either a philosophical life or a Christian life. But I don't want to give up having affairs or having a mistress at least. I think I can do both at the same time. I'll, I'll you know, burn the candle at both ends, as we say. And it doesn't work out for him. But he has to learn this sort of stuff by actually trying to make it work. And he learns by looking at his, his friends, too, doesn't he? His, his other companions. So let's think about um, Augustine's desires. And I'm going to use a couple different words here. Desires, loves, and enjoyment. So what are they? What does he start? He starts out with, you know, infancy and childhood. He says, I don't remember my infancy because... I was a little baby. Do any of you remember being a little baby? No? I mean, I, I think there's something normal about not remembering that kind of thing. And there's different theories for why we don't remember that, but you know, we don't have to get into those. Point is, we learn about other baby, we learn about what we were as a baby by other people telling us or by looking at other babies. And how many of you have had a younger brother or sister that you had to had to deal with when they were a baby? Only a few of you? Was it fun? There were some fun, some fun moments, right? What was unfun about it? Yeah. I'm trying to like, bite your hair and stuff like that. <laughs> That's true. Oh, yeah. Cats sometimes do that, too. Um, kittens, at least. Trying to bite your hair, yeah. Bite your fingers. Bite everything that there is. Why? Because a baby's motivated by desire to, to bite things. Um, to chew on things. To digest them. You know, they're, they're basically... Uh, one step up from, from eating machines. Uh, what else was not fun about babies? Yeah. They cry a lot. They go on a lot, don't they? Uh, it doesn't take much to set a baby off. And Augustine is you know, he's probably that. Why do babies cry? Because there's something they they want that they're not getting, and a baby's desires are just you know all over the place. They would eat everything they possibly could. They're like dogs in that respect. Dogs will eat you know way more than they want to. Uh, if you let them, that's why you, you know you have to be kind of circumspect about how much food you give them, especially table scraps. Babies will eat anything too. Um, I remember my son when he was little. My daughter, I would you know I would be watching her and, and watching the TV, and it'd be like in the late afternoon, and I'd have a beer and I'd be drinking it, and I like very bitter beer, so I would take you know my my finger and dip it in the beer and you know touch it to her to her tongue, and she. Make that you know face, and we only did this a few times. And that's a normal reaction. Bitterness. Babies don't like bitterness. My son, as soon as I did that, he like lashed onto my finger, and then I thought, oh, I better not do that at all because this kid actually likes beer already. <laughs> you know, you don't want to encourage that sort of sort of taste. It turns out he's probably what we call a super taster. You know, he likes very bitter things, and and uh, uh, who knows. Who knows what the explanation is? Point is, babies have these inordinate desires, and that's why they cry. Some of the things are legitimate. They want to be changed, right? That's one reason they cry. Um, babies can cry for no reason whatsoever. And then you try to comfort them, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. My daughter, I actually had to put her in the car and drive for miles to get her to, to stop crying and go to sleep sometimes. That's what it took. Uh, it's a good thing we have cars. So otherwise, I don't know what I would have would have done in those cases. Um, what happens after he, he quits being an infant? What does he start to desire? What what do you what do you remember? There's another thing too. Let me not just put desires, but also the, the flip side of it is fears, fears and pains. He has to go to school, right? Is school a pleasant experience for Saint Augustine? Or not St. Augustine, but Little Augie. 
What does, what does he tell you about going to school? Again, you might be able to relate to him. Not with the beating part, I hope. I hope not if you were beaten in school. Uh, he was. Why was he beaten? Just for the sheer fun of it? Schoolmasters, you know, got a taste for the, the lash and wanted to initiate him. And some of the you know British uh, schools kind of looked like that for a while. Um, they wanted him to learn, right? And if he, he didn't want to learn, what did he want to do? What did you want to do as a kid? Play. What's that? Play. Play, yeah. And he talks about games where, you know, he's off with his friends. And even with that, there's rivalries. You, you want to win, right? You want to be on top. His parents want him to learn. The schoolmaster wants him to learn. Augustine is not really that interested in learning at that point, is he? He's even less interested when they beat him. You know, he doesn't learn Greek because he's got a Greek teacher who is cruel to him. Learning is not yet something that he desires at that point. What, what else does he desire as a kid? What else is he on the lookout for? What about companionship? Is that, is that something important to you when you're in first grade, second grade, third grade? I know it's going back quite a ways. Was that very important for you? Yeah. Well, you always want a friend. At least one, right? Uh, and then, you know, it's nice to have other kids that you, you can hang out with, especially if that one friend. You never know if they're, they're going to be busy or... Because you have, like, play dates when you're younger. Yeah. You know, that was something different for your generation. We didn't have play dates. We had go over to so-and-so's house, you know, um, get out of my hair. <laughs> we didn't have anything like, like play dates, but it makes sense in the kind of environment that we, we live in now to schedule these sorts of things. Um, what happened when he hits puberty? His father figures out that he's hit puberty because they're, they're in public baths, which was a big thing back then. You know, the Romans, and Augustine is living in North Africa, but it's Roman culture. Um, Augustine, by the way, is not a Roman. He's most likely um, one of the, you know, descended from some of the local tribes people around here. Monica is uh, a local name. That's the name of his, his mother. Monique, we get from Monica. Uh, is my mother's name, actually. And... His father sees him uh, in the bath and realizes that he's turning into a young man. And how does he describe it? I mean, let's, let's look at some of the things that, that he says. Um, <coughs> he says, uh, here we go. This is the beginning of book two. I wish now to review in memory my past wickedness and the carnal corruptions of my soul, etc., etc., etc. As I became a youth, I longed to be satisfied with worldly things. So some of these are worldly things, and we'll look at some other worldly things. And dared to grow wild in a succession of various and shadowy loves. What was it that delighted me save to love and be loved? So he had a desire to be loved. He had a desire to love. Remember back to like 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade. And when, when you know, these, these hormones were washing over you and these feelings of, I wish I had somebody who I could, I could you know, be affectionate with. And it's not just about sexual desire. He's going to talk about it in terms of sexual desire. There's also this sense of wanting Affection from somebody. Do you remember, like, you know, ever, I don't know, do they pass notes still in school? Is that, is that something they do, or is everything's done by text? I, I don't know. Um, back in our day, it used to be passing notes. And you get a note, and uh, it would say, so and so likes you. And suddenly, your day has gotten a lot better, hasn't it? That's kind of a weird thing. 
why the hell should your day get better because you know you've got some note you don't even know if it's true or false maybe somebody's just leading you along but that feeling being being loved being uh, the object of attraction being the object of affection for another person that's something that you begin to desire through through puberty um, Sometimes children develop that earlier, you know, because of, because of abuse, but that's, that's a little bit different. Usually the normal development is you become very interested in how other people see you as, as a desirable object, as, as an object of affection. Uh, and you also want to exert that towards somebody else. It's not just wanting to get laid. It's not just wanting to, you know, engage in... in, in kissing or, or sex or stuff like that. It's wanting to actually show affection to another person. And very often, you know, people aren't, aren't quite sure how to do this, so you get, you know, boys who push the girl down or something like that. Um, you know, or they give them a valentine and it's some nasty note. And then you say, this isn't the way that you actually do things. If you want to show somebody that you like them, then you're going about it the wrong way. Because what's really going on in them is they, they, uh, they want to exert affection towards somebody else. So Augustine says, what is it that delighted me save to love and be loved? He says, still I did not keep the moderate way of the love of mind to mind, the bright path of friendship. Instead, the mists of passion steamed up out of the puddly concupiscence of the flesh and the hot imagination of puberty, and they so obscured and overcast my heart, I was unable to distinguish pure affection from unholy desire. Okay, what's going on there? He's flooded with hormones the way that a kid is normally at that age. He's in a culture where all these other kids are going through the same sort of thing. He's seeing all these attractive bodies are all around, and he's finding himself attracted to them. Uh, you know, very common behavior, right? And, and it is confusing, isn't it? Do you remember that, that confusion that comes with this? Or was it all just crystal clear, you know, something, some switch flipped in your head and now everything was totally clear to you? No, most, most of the time it's pretty confusing. When you become infatuated with somebody, um, you become a little tongue-tied, a little clumsy around them. That's, that's a sign of that confusion working through you. And he, um, he talks about you know, this being a problem for him throughout the rest of his life. This... He, you know, for him, it ends up being sexual desire. What else does he want out of life? Is Augustine just about playing and having sex, having friends? What other things come into his life in these later books? Well, let's think about this. What, what does he go off to do? Does he sit at home, learn a craft? What does he do instead? He's where you guys are, isn't he? For a while. Any, anybody here doing a communications degree? That's what Augustine did. Back then they called it rhetoric. And in your comm degree, you will actually be studying some of the classic authors who were rhetoricians because they laid the foundations for study of communication, among other people, right? Um, now, what is, why is he going to school? Why is he studying rhetoric? Does he talk like he enjoys it for its own sake? Not really. Let's think about this. Why do you want to go to school? Better than staying at home? That's, that's not a very good reason to go to Marist. <laughs> right? uh, the freedom that it brings? Yeah. Um, well, you want a successful future. Okay. So we talked about winning. Like winning a game, that's pretty trivial stuff. A successful future is something much bigger. What does that look like? What do you mean? What does it look like? What would be components of, of a successful future? Um, I guess getting the job that you always wanted or a, like that 
fits your needs. Okay, so professional success. <clears throat> How do you know if you're doing your job well? What are, what are signs of that in our culture? Um, well, you could be getting, like, moving up in status. Mm -hmm. that, that's a big one, promotions. Yeah. Uh, being given more responsibilities mm -hmm. usually comes with promotions. Sometimes they, they screw you over and they give you a different title and some more responsibilities, but no more money. You know, you're not, it's not really a promotion. That's just moving, they call that a lateral move. Um, what else? You had your hand up. I was going to say uh, a raise. That yeah, that's, that's along the same lines. Money. We, we, do need, <clears throat> we do need wealth. Is that all that people want out of their careers? If we're honest with ourselves. Why, why do people, let's say, you know, look at how people become envious of each other. Sometimes we can figure out the, the good by looking at the, the opposite, the bad. Um, sometimes they become envious because <clears throat> their friend gets a bigger paycheck, right? Or has a better title. What else do people get envious about in the workplace? Yeah. Like if, someone, if one person's happy in their job and another person isn't. Yeah, or at least seems happier, right? Because some people like, you know, cheerful face all the time. Um, if one person seems to be having a better time, enjoying themselves more, that's, that's part of, I think all of you, I hope, when you're aiming for your good career, you want something that'll be enjoyable for you, not just, you know, lots of titles and, and money, responsibility, but you actually enjoy what you're doing. What else? Yeah. If someone's boss likes them more than someone else. Yeah. Now, it could be the boss, or it could be, like, fellow employees. When people um, honor you, is, is, would be the old term. When, they, when you have a better reputation, when you have more prestige. <coughs> um, people get very upset about these, these sorts of things. Somebody publishes an article, and, you know, everyone congratulates them, but inside some of their, their peers feel envious. Why did they get to do that, but not me? You know, my career's going nowhere. There's this taking off. These are the sort of things that ordinary lives are actually made of. And Augustine is after honor. That's part of being successful for him. Studying rhetoric will give him access to the higher culture. Just like going here to Marist. You know, why is it that going to college is, is portrayed in our culture as the key to success? Just any college? As it turns out, once you get out, you find out it doesn't matter where you went to college. People don't look at degrees all in the same light. You guys are doing good. I don't want to scare any of you. Um, but not every college has a great reputation. And part of what, part of what you know, is really good about Marist is they're very good at connecting you to, to people who will help you in your careers and help you develop as a as a professional. Um, Augustine wants access to that. That's why he's going to school. Once he actually graduates, he becomes a master and starts teaching. And what does he want when he's teaching? The big, big chair at Harvard? No, no, he's not so interested in that. Why does he move from, from city to city and teaching post to teaching post? Is it to try to get higher and higher positions? Not exactly. Do you know why I like teaching here at Marist better than some of the other places I've taught? It's not because of this classroom. We talked about that before this class began, right? Uh, I've, I've, I've taught a few other crappy classrooms here at Marist. Um, although most, most of the classrooms are pretty nice. Is it the, the accommodations in the cafeteria? Because, you know, we get cheaper meals over in the cafeteria, we get like half off. Um, no, that's not what attracted me to Marist. The desks? The, the equipment? Nope. Then we use iLearn? Lots of places use Sakai. The great library. I like the library, but 
there's, you know, if I, if I wanted to access a bigger library around here, I'd, I'm willing to bet Bass or Bard might, might have books that we don't have over there. Why? Why that? It's not the paycheck either. As an adjunct, I'm not making a ton of money. Yeah. The students? <coughs> yeah. Now, what about Mara students? There. You dress better, right? Yeah. We're high end. Yeah. <laughs> I can learn about the, the ins and outs of, of culture. You know, we talked about hipster culture a couple days ago before class. That's not it. What why? What, what, what about you students? Um I think our work ethic and our like the way we're interactive with in class. Yeah. Especially the work ethic. You guys don't talk as much as students in, in a lot of other places. It takes a lot of work to get Mara students to be talkative. Um, I know that you guys are thinking about things because I see it in your writing. Um, when I assign you guys work, you do it. A lot of a lot of schools that you go to, they give you a very hard time about it, and they won't they won't hand in the work and it won't be up to standards. Most of the students that I have in my classes do the work and they learn a lot in the process because you know, I designed the work to, to help you learn. And it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's great. I, I like reading your papers because I can see you guys thinking while I'm reading them, and I enjoy that. Um, I, I've never had to use that part in the syllabus that we talked about at the beginning of the semester with, if a student gets out of line, I'll kick them out of the class. I've never had to use it at Marist. Lots of other places I've taught, I've had to kick students out of class. Augustine, talks about the students in Carthage, it's like a zoo. They just come in and out of class whenever, whenever they feel like it. Um, they, they do whatever they want. You know, they, they give the teacher a hard time. And so he says, I'm getting the hell out of here. I'm going to Rome. I'm going to a different place. And then when he gets to Rome, are the students, the students are at least not doing that, but what do they do? They don't pay the teacher. Back then, you, you had to actually collect, you know, Imagine that after each class, I like say, okay, I'm going to put up the contribution jar here. Everybody put in their, their money. Um, now you know, everyone like you know pretends oh, I didn't hear that. I've got somewhere to go. That's what happens to them in Rome, and they don't pay. So he says, this isn't good either. I'm going to Milan, and I'm going to teach there. He wants, um, in some respects, peace of mind, or he uses this word at different points. We rewrite that, so that's legible. Uh, ease. He wants things to go along smoothly. Is that something you guys can relate to in your life? I think so. Something happens to him while he's, he's studying. And this may be the experience for you. Um, you know, I'm throwing some classic texts at you. That may be the thing that works for you. It may be something you read in another class. He reads Cicero's Hortensius, and this awakens him to the desire for knowledge or wisdom, which he thinks he's going to get through through philosophy. You know, when when you have that that experience of some author or some text really opening your eyes. And it might not be Cicero, it might not be Augustine for you. Who knows who it's going to be. It might be somebody. <clears throat> but I hope it happens for, for each one of you. I know it's happened to me a number of times, because um, I've been pretty lucky in that respect. You, you become aware of this entire vast world outside of yourself, and outside of the sphere of your own desires, that there are higher things, more lasting things. And when you become aware of that, you become infected, you might say, with desire for that. Desire for the eternal, desire for the essential, desire for what's really real, what's more real than the everyday humdrum activities that we're involved in. You know, filling in forms, uh, sitting in desks, all that sort of stuff, sticking to the schedule. You become interested in higher meaning. And that's, a, that's eventually going to lead him to God. Augustine, you know, this is the beginning. He's, he's got a mom who's, you know, a Catholic and is, you know, catechized him when he was a kid, but he didn't pay any attention to that stuff. I mean, when you read books one and two and three, it's pretty clear that none of it stuck, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be taking a mistress, having a kid by her, all these sorts of things. 
um, trying to get out of doing work. What gets him moving in that direction is this desire. And notice we have all these desires all going on, all at the same time. And we have to choose which ones we're going to follow. And if we don't choose, other things will choose for us. Because these desires all push on us. You know? I mean, the sexual desire is the one that Augustine struggles with the most. And just think about how strong that is. Think about how hard it is for some people to get out of bad relationships because they like having sex with that person in that relationship, even though they can't stand that person otherwise. They still stay in that relationship with them. You know? Or they can't keep themselves out of relationships long enough to actually follow through on any of the other things that they want. It's a very strong desire. It is for, for many human beings. It is for Augustine. And if you don't, at some point, take stock of your desires and think about which ones you, you want to follow, which ones are actually more worthwhile, you're, you're going to get drawn into all sorts of thickets, you might say, and uh, blind spots. So we, we've looked at Augustine's desires. Let's, let's go through his his life and some of the high points in this section, just a, in, in very brief. So we start out infancy, childhood, then uh, adolescence, becomes aware of uh, girls, you know, and uh, how much he likes them. And then what happens? Towards the, uh, the, the middle of the end of, of book two, there's this pear tree incident. And we're going to come back to that because it's a very important uh, part right there. Um, now this is where he does something, and it's just totally incomprehensible to him. What the hell is he doing? He draws some, some lessons from that. Then he, uh, you know, he becomes a student in, in college, uh, becomes a, a master eventually, has some more friendships, experiences a terrible loss that he's going to tell us about. On the way, discovers that he likes philosophy and, and wants to learn more about it. Um, then he ends up joining a cult. And this, this is something that, in order to make sense of what's going on, what about Manichaeism? Uh, Manichaeism was a Gnostic religion. Uh, some people want to say it's a Gnostic form of Christianity, but it really, it, it's, it's in its uh, traditional form, blending not only Christianity, but also Buddhism in certain respects, and um, uh, a particular form of Zoroastrianism. So it's, it's syncretic. It's blending together all sorts of religions. And Augustine turns to Manichaeism because it seems to provide some answers to the questions that he's asking. Like, what is life all about? What is most real? What should I be turning myself towards? <clears throat> a lot of people find these sort of answers in religion, don't they? Instead of in philosophy. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, too, by the way. I want to go on the record with that. I don't think everybody has to study philosophy to, to, to grapple with these questions. I think that great literature grapples with these questions. I think that every major world religion tries to grapple with these questions. I think that if you study history well, you're trying to grapple with these questions. It's not necessarily just through philosophy. Um, <clears throat> oh, yes. Augustine has posed these three choices. Devote myself to philosophy. Philosophy seems to provide more questions than it does answers in many respects, in part because not all the philosophers agree about you know, what you ought to be doing. There's Stoics, there's Platonists, there's Aristotelians, there's Epicureans. <clears throat> you notice in this class, we've already plumbed a number of different philosophical doctrines, right? Manichaeism provides what seem to be like answers. It's this incredible cosmogony of, you know, where evil came from, what the good is, and, and here's, I'm going to give it to you in a very, very attenuated form. <clears throat> Gnostic Christianity and other forms of Gnosticism will say that, that the universe is fundamentally bad. 
that this was created by an evil force, <clears throat> not by a good force. So salvation lies in getting outside of the boundaries of creation, of created being. Your bodies are bad. Your souls are actually bad. The powers and principalities that rule over everything, they're bad. They want to keep you trapped here in this prison. What gets you out of that prison is some sort of savior being. This is how they were able to bring together Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Christianity. In Christianity, who's the savior being? Jesus, right? Zoroastrianism has the, these no notions of the uh, Sayoshans, these savior beings. And Buddhism, by the time that they're, they're dealing with it, has all sorts of notions of salvation coming up as well. And you have beings like the, uh, not just the, the Buddha himself, but these um, other beings coming about it in Mahayana Buddhism who <coughs> deliberately devote themselves to getting people out of this veil of, of nothingness, of illusion, of this prison world that we're in. And so how do you practice this? Well, you know, you can practice it in a number of different ways. And they had their own sort of like church hierarchy. And uh, he mentions this Faustus guy. Faustus is a bishop. And it was kind of a counter-organization to Orthodox or Catholic Christianity at the time. And what, what really appealed to people about Manichaeism, it felt like you were in the know. It felt like you were special. Because you're hearing this message. And it's not for all those other dummies out there who are, you know, like reading the Bible or, you know, trying to just be good people. You've got the message. You've got the secret that all those other poor saps don't have. And they may not even be people in some versions of, of Gnosticism. Um, but you are. You're valuable. And you can work your way towards getting out of this. It's an elitist sort of religion. Had all sorts of um, other things rolled into it, and Augustine was unsatisfied with the answers that he would get when he'd ask questions. Um, when he looked at Christianity, and when he looked at, you know, the, the Christian scriptures, at that age, he couldn't make much, much sense of them. You notice that one of the key themes that runs throughout this is that one of the reasons why he rejected God over and over and over again is because he didn't really know what God was. He didn't have a good conception. He had a not only did he not have a good conception, sort of like a fuzzy picture, he actually had the wrong conception of what God was. And so, you know, what he's rejecting a lot of the time isn't what God actually is. This is according to Augustine. Uh, same thing with the scriptures. They seem kind of stupid. You know? There's, there's all sorts of seeming contradictions in them. And there's, you know, they're, they're not written in a very high style philosophy. That's kind of an elite activity, too. It's written for these, you know, smart people. But, you know, the Bible's kind of low class. So at, the, at that age, he's, he's not ready for, for that sort of thing. So he winds up being a manichae for, for quite a while. And he associates with some friends. And he, you notice that he actually converts one of his friends, the one who's later going to die, away from his orthodox faith to manichaeism. And then he goes back. His friend goes back. Um, now, one of the other things, um, I'm, I'm going through this very quickly, unfortunately, because I do want to get to some of these incidents. One of the other things that you need, one of the pieces of the puzzle, in order to make sense of, of what's being said in the rest of this, is what we could call... Um, Augustine's, let's call it his ethics, or his moral doctrine. And the, the basic idea is that there is a hierarchy of goods. There are higher and lower goods. So, um, Having sex is, is kind of a lower good. It's fun. It's a good thing, you know. Uh, even if it produces children, children aren't a bad thing, you know. Like Augustine says, they compel us to love them. Why? Because they are lovable, despite all the crying and, you know, the 
constantly need to be changed and all that other stuff that goes along with it. The biting things, um, the ruining whatever it is that you set them on. Um, good things are actually good things. Having sex is a good thing. Augustine isn't antibody. The human body is a good thing. Uh, candy is a good thing. That's why you like eating candy. Drinking beer is a good thing. But these lower things are only good when they're kept within the proper context. So you have the human being, and the human being has to choose in, in all sorts of situations of life, are they going to go for the higher goods or are they going to go for the lower goods? And what are we prompted by? Desire. And part of our nature as we are right now, and there's a whole long story about you know, why this is the case. I'm not going to try to go into this now. I'll just say the words original sin. Um, part of why we're oriented badly at the start is we're, we have stronger desires for the lower goods. We don't automatically become aware of our desire for philosophy, for, for example, or something like philosophy, something like a meaning in life. But we all know that we want to eat, we want comfort, we want to, you know, once you're past puberty, we want to have sex, um, we want people to, to look up to us, all those sorts of things. Lower goods, in order to remain good, have to be arranged in an order. If they're pursued just for their own sake, they're pursued in a disordered way. And so something that's actually good can become bad for us in certain contexts. Let's, let's take you know, drinking beer, for example. Um, most of you are underage. So is there anything inherently bad about you drinking beer right now at 18? Uh, nobody here is still 17, right? 17, yeah. Uh, 19, you know. Um, is there anything inherently bad about it? No. So you might actually feel kind of like cheated because you don't get to drink beer and people who are 21 do. That's an arbitrary limit. It's an ordering that was produced by our society in part because through trial and error we figured out that if you let 18 year olds drink all sorts of you know, terrible things happen, more terrible things than when you, when you boost it up to 21. But it doesn't have to be that way. Other societies, how many of you traveled abroad up until this point? Um, other places you can drink, right? When I was in the army, I could drink at 18 uh, because there, there weren't any uh, laws about that. Those are all state laws um, when I was overseas. And then I came back, and I wasn't quite 21, and I couldn't drink anymore. And I felt cheated. Um, there's an ordering there. What's bad about you drinking right now? You're breaking the law. It's not about the beer itself, or the wine, or the liquor, or pick whatever you want. There are some other limits within the thing itself. What happens if you drink beer all day long, every day? You know, last year at Marist, just imagine trying to drink every single day. You know, what your life would be like. It would change very rapidly, wouldn't it? Just you'd be so hungover after like a week that you, you couldn't stand doing it. Um, either that, or you'd become like a hardcore alcoholic. And, a whole set of other problems. We could do this with any other lower good. Um, what is the highest good for Augustine? It's actually going to be God. The most permanent, the most foundational good. Because all these other goods are good, including the human being, because they're coming originally from God. God is the one who knows them best can provide us with the best insight into what the proper order is to them. Um, but we don't always you know, automatically listen. And, and if somebody you know, reads you the Ten Commandments, that doesn't automatically produce conviction in you that you shouldn't steal, for example, right? It takes, it takes working on ourselves. And Augustine is attentive to our choices in this matter with respect to the will. When we go wrong, we do so by pursuing lower goods 
in a disordered way and ignoring the higher goods, which should be more valuable than that. Uh, which could be not necessarily God, they could be friendship, could be a higher good. You know, when you sacrifice a friendship for something like money, you're screwing things up, Augustine would say. You're, you're, you've got a disordered view of things. And it's not just in the intellect, it's in the will, it's in your, your faculty of choice. And your will decides which desires you're going to follow. Um, so this is a good place to, to jump off now into this pear tree incident. And then if we have time, we'll talk about the, the death of the friend. So Augustine is engaged in an act of theft with a bunch of his friends. <clears throat> could have been vandalism, could have been um, cow tipping, could have been pick whatever thing that you like that kids do, um, because kids are quite often jerks, right? Um, to toilet papering somebody's house, you know, uh, for no good reason whatsoever. It's not like they screwed you over, just to do it. Um, we're all familiar with that kind of impulse, right? Um, <clears throat> Augustine says to himself, so we, we, we took these pears, and we didn't even eat them. We just gave them to pigs. And why did we do it? Because we liked stealing. We liked the act of theft. We, I desired to steal. Why? So that's the big question. Why? What's the reason? What's the good? Why do people steal in a lot of cases? Some people steal because they need things. And stealing is the easiest way to get it. Right? It's the reason a lot of people steal. For some people it becomes their mode of life, and you know there's all sorts of other problems and complications there. Um, maybe they could have stolen the pears to uh, do something like bring them to the theater and throw them at the, the terrible uh, you know, actors or something like that, that would at least pre be some reason to do it. Augustine is concerned because it doesn't seem like there's any reason outside of the sheer act of stealing, which is a, is a bad act. So it looks like he is desiring evil or the bad for its own sake. You know, he talks about murder. Why do people kill each other? Um, people kill each other because they get angry with each other. That's one big reason. Somebody sleeps with somebody else's spouse. They kill the spouse or the, the other person. People get frustrated with each other. They shoot each other on the highway. Sometimes people kill each other for money or to have access to, to the goods that the other person has. They, they try to kill competitors. These are all bad things to do, but they're all pursued for the sake of some sort of good to that person who's doing it. It's very rare that you find somebody who says, I just like killing people. I, I'm, I'm just into that. I mean, even when they do that, it's because they get sexual satisfaction out of it in some you know, perverted way, or it's about honor or something like that. It's very rare that you can find somebody who says, I just like killing for its own sake. But Augustine is doing this with stealing. So what's going on there? There's no good. They don't need these pairs for anything. It's not, not doing anything. He doesn't actually need to get in with these friends. It's not like an initiation right. He's got another possibility. He says, well, you know, if we think about different vices, maybe it's not some external object that I wanted, something that would come out of it. Maybe I wanted the act because there is actually something desirable or beautiful or significant about the act itself. So he says, you know, think about a pride. People who are prideful, at least it looks like they think a lot of themselves. And that could be, in some respects, a good thing. Or if people are spendthrifts, they at least look kind of like generous people. You know, there's some semblance. There's some shadow of beauty to it. There's some shadow of attractiveness to it. He says, was there anything like that in my act? No. There was nothing redeeming about it. There was nothing you know, pretty, attractive, cool about it. 
so what the hell is wrong with me? Why did I do that? If I, if I did that sort of thing then, who knows what sort of stuff I'm going to do as an adult. If I could just like go off the deep end and do something wrong just for its own sake, what was going on there? And he puts his finger on it when he starts looking at these different vices and what's going on with them. He calls it a... Um, he says that there's, there's a kind of counterfeit of freedom that occurs with this. I'm actually going to read this passage because it's, it's quite, uh, quite good. He says, what was it that I loved in that theft? I was imitating God in a certain respect. <clears throat> I was trying to make myself like God. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Uh, jumping from... Yeah, I, I, was, I knocked down some road signs and stuck them in somebody's lawn. Why? I was imitating God. Can you imagine somebody giving that as, as an uh, answer for why they did what they did wrong? Why did you trip me down the, you know, as I was walking down the stairs? Imitating God. Why? He says, um, I want to, by that gesture, to rebel against your law, to rebel against the moral code to rebel against right and wrong, to, to place myself above right and wrong, even though I had no power to do that. I can't actually get outside of morality altogether. I'm kind of stuck with it. But I can actually push against it, and I can produce a kind of what he calls counterfeit freedom by doing with impunity deeds that were forbidden in a deluded sen sen sense of impotence. What is attractive about this, doing wrong for its own sake, is it feels like... Power feels like freedom. Feels like something in a certain way divine. That's the kick that we get out of being jerks or being horrific people. Sometimes at the other extreme, people. There are some people who do murder other people just for the sake of murdering them. It's because they want this. There are people who break up a relationship and cheat on their spouse for no reason whatsoever other than because they can do it. And oftentimes the justification that they give is, I wanted to feel alive. I wanted to feel something. That's what they want to feel, according to Augustine. And why is this important? Is it just, you know, this, this screwed up kid who did this, you know, stupid act of stealing pears and giving them to pigs, something we can't relate to? No, this is something that lies within every single one of us as a possibility at any given time. This is something he's revealing to us, something about human nature, that most of the time when we do bad things, there's a reason that's pretty easy to come across. I wanted some, some good over here that was going to come from it. Why did I uh, yell at you know this person? Because I wanted them to do this action that, that would have been beneficial to me. Right? That sort of thing. Why did I uh, do this stupid thing over here? Because I want to get in good with these friends, because I care about what they think of me. Um, why did I do this? Because my, uh, my significant other made me feel embarrassed, and I didn't want to feel embarrassed. I wanted to overcome that, so I yelled at them or, or you know, uh, made fun of them instead. Sometimes there's things in the act itself that make the act attractive. Once you develop a habit for something, for example, Sometimes it's this. And, and Augustine goes on and he says, you know what this is? The theft was a nothing. There was really nothing involved in it. It was a way for me to bring nothingness into the world. So what the hell was wrong with me again? Well, I, was, I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't with those, those stupid companions. So maybe I didn't really love the theft. Maybe it was that I loved the companionship, the friendship. He says, is, does that really hold? Not really, because I don't actually like those people. I don't care what they think. I know I wouldn't have done it on my own, but it's not like I did it to win their approval, because uh, I don't even think that they're worthy of providing me approval. They're just a bunch of dummies or scumbags um, that I was slumming with and did this stupid thing. They're a nothing as well. So there's two nothings. We human beings, and this is where it gets very metaphysical, have the capacity to bring nothingness into the world, as opposed to what 
things are supposed to be. That's the lesson of the pear tree. Um, as you read through it again, some of these points hopefully will, will come out to you. He talks about another incident that's very important as well. Um, Augustine is a very close friend. By now he's already chasing women and um, he's, you know, getting himself involved in all sorts of crazy stuff, but he's also developed a, a very good uh, friendship. And actually by now he's actually fathered a child too. Um, an illegitimate uh, hookup that turns into like a lifelong affair, almost. Um, he develops this really close friendship, and the friend dies. And his whole life changes. How many of you have had a, a close relative or a friend die in your, in your life? Well, about half of them. Um, I mean, everybody's going to have to go through that sooner or later. Somebody close to you will die, because mortality rate's 100%. And either you die before them or they die before you. Um, either way, it's, it kind of sucks. What can we actually learn from it? Why, why do we have the sorts of reactions that we do? If you look at the way that he um, talks about it, he says, my heart was utterly darkened by the sorrow. Everywhere I looked, I saw death. You guys, those of you who have gone through a close uh, person, somebody close to you dying, you know what this is like. You feel down, gloomy. It's, it's very hard to think about other things. My native place is a torture room to me and my father's house of strange unhappiness. You feel out of sorts. You feel like you don't fit in anymore. That's a normal reaction. And then he says, my eyes sought him everywhere, but they did not see him, and I hated all places because he was not in them. There's a, a good that's lacking now. And the lack of that good makes other things bad. Same thing can happen with a breakup, too, by the way. You know, you, you're close to somebody, you have your places, and then you break up, and now you don't want to go back to those places anymore because it reminds you of them, and they're not there, and you can't, you know, have that relationship anymore. Um, even though it's bringing back good memories, it's also painful to you at the same time. We are we're full of these sort of contradictions. So he says, I became a hard riddle to myself and asked my soul why she was so downcast and why this disquieted me so sorely. And then he said, um, she didn't know how to answer me. And if I said hope in God, which probably his mom said to him, she properly disobeyed me. Why? Because my conception of God wasn't something that could actually fill in the gap here. What do I care about some old guy in the sky kind of thing? Um, he says, nothing but tears were sweet to me. And I took my friend's place in my heart's desire. So tears become sweet. And this guy balls his eyes out for days and days and days, which is actually good for you. It, it makes sense. Um, manliness was not understood by a lot of the ancients as precluding crying the way that it has been understood in, in, at some points in, in American culture. Um, Odysseus cries, and he's a tough guy. Odysseus cries over his men as he's rowing his lost companions. If Odysseus can cry, it's okay for Augustine to cry. It's okay for, for just about anybody to cry. But why? Why is he crying? What's he getting out of it? He says, my tears took my friend's place in my heart's desire. So that means that he, he wanted to cry. He says, um, every soul is wretched that is fettered in the friendship of mortal things. It's torn when it loses them. Why is he so upset? He made a mistake. Remember a little bit earlier I was talking about ordering of goods? Friendship is at a very high good, but it's not the highest good. And if you expect that your friend is going to live forever, or that your parents are going to live forever, or that your children are going to live forever, um, at least in the bodily sense, you're really setting yourself up for some sorrow. Because sooner or later, everybody does die. 
things, things break apart. He says, if, if the soul is fettered in the friendship of moral things, it's torn to pieces when it loses them. Then it realizes its misery. For Augustine, we're not all just happy people all the time. Why do we desire the things that we do? Because they make us happy. Because we don't want to be unhappy instead. You know, when you talk about wanting to be friends, having a close friend. Think of the opposite of that. It's loneliness. You're in a strange place. Why did we do orientation for you here at Maris? So that you wouldn't feel as lonely coming in as, as you do when you first get there. Imagine you made no friends whatsoever, how lonely that would be. Um, we, when your friend is taken away, now you realize how lonely you really are. When your other things that you like are taken away, you realize just how sad or hungry or broken you actually are. And you may not have realized that before that good came into your life and you made it the center of your life. So he says, I wept most bitterly and I found a rest in bitterness. I was wretched, and yet that wretched life was dearer to me than, than my friend. I was more concerned about you know my life than about the, the loss of the friend because I, I would have willingly have changed um, my life, but I was still more unwilling to lose it than to have lost him. And he says, I was caught in this kind of trap. It was wearisome to live and a fearful thing to die. And he says that, um, well, I may have been afraid to die. My, I, I was afraid to die because my friend would then die wholly, the one who I so greatly loved. And he says, my, my heart became an unhappy lodging where I could neither stay or leave. So, what was going on there? It was putting his, his love into things that can't fully support that. Now, is Augustine saying, well, don't get close to anybody? No, but, but realize that your friend is not the highest good. So if you orient your life around lower goods and make those the most precious things in your life and you never think about higher things, you're really setting yourself up for some misery. What gets him out of it? <clears throat> um, well, what gets him out of it is what tells you why friendship is so important to Augustine. He says, what revived and refreshed me more than anything else was the consolation of all my friends. That's why it's important to have more than one friend, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's going to happen when that friendship breaks up? That, that's also important, too, why when you get really attached to somebody, uh, you know, romantically, don't quit hanging out with the rest of your friends. Because if you break up, you're going to need those friends to have a, a shoulder to cry on about how terrible your life has gotten now that that other person exited your life. Um, he says, with these other friends, I went on loving the things that I loved. And what are these? Well, uh, he gives examples. Discor to discoursing and, and joking around. Isn't that fun? Talking with your friends. Um, indulging in courteous exchanges, reading pleasant books together. Trifling together. It means just wasting time together. Uh, being earnest together. Being serious about the same sort of things. Could be even like watching a game. Sports. To differ at times without ill humor as a man might do with himself. Um, sometimes teaching, sometimes being taught. And he says, this is what we love in our friends. This is what friendship is really about. Losing a friend reveals to us why friendship is such a good. We love it so much this is where Augustine is going way beyond any of the people we studied. We love it so much, friendship, that a man's conscience accuses itself if he does not love one who loves him. Augustine is saying that when somebody is, is, is uh, affectionate towards us, we feel like we ought to be affectionate towards them. It's very easy in the case of like sexual attraction, in some cases, because somebody's infatuated with us, suddenly they look a little bit better. We all naturally like other people to like us. Um, that may not do it for a lot of cases, right? There could be, well, I, I still don't like them, but it's nice that they like them. Um, but the same thing with other, you know, likings of that way. He says, a man's conscience accuses itself if he does not love one who loves him, or respond in love to love, seeking nothing from the other but the evidences of his love. There we're talking about love and friendship in a very different way than we were with Plato or Aristotle or Cicero or, or Epicurus, aren't we? 
We're in something that's much more like what you guys had already experienced in your middle school crushes, high school friendships, you know, whatever it is that you're doing here as adults in college, and what you're going to be doing the rest of your life. So that's, that's where we'll leave off for today.